are live. How is it going, sir? Going pretty well today. Uh, I wrote almost double my usual word count today, so... That's good. For us writers, that's an achievement, man. Yeah. <laughs> so... Okay, good. That is the right one. <laughs> so, sorry, I have, I have, so I have, I, I keep my questions in little note files on my desktop, and I, I have like several because I have a bunch of things I'm working on, and for a second I thought I had the wrong one pulled up. <laughs> so, you are Daniel Potter. I am. You wrote Off Leash, which is the what, what's the series? It's the the freelance called freelance familiars. familiars. Freelance familiars, which is wizard familiars for those who are like freelance familiars. Wizard familiars, what where he's going with that? Right. And uh, I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting little concept you've put together, and we'll get to it very shortly. But first, uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Uh, what's interesting about you? What's your background look like? Give us give us the deets. Oh, so. Um... I spent the last 20 years uh, being a vascular biologist, pretty much. Um, I got my uh, PhD uh, and was like, oh, this is cool, but I'm not a mad scientist. Where's all the crazy like animal hybrids and giant robots and stuff? And I'm like, what? all my creativity needs to go somewhere and it wasn't in science. So I'm like, okay, now I've been trying to dig out of academia with a spork into a writing career because trying to do a writing career is hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally went full time um, in January. So that's good luck. I, 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 I sincerely wish you the best. I too am trying to, uh, someday make my writing my full-time job, but right now personal training is what pays the bills. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, yes. Well, I still do some biology contracting to pay the bills. So yeah, that's. I mean, I'm not in, and I'm not sitting in a closet, um, doing bad things to mice for <laughs> 40 hours a week anymore. <laughs> so doing bad things to mice. I like that analogy. Those poor, poor mice. They never saw the scalpel coming. Injury. Yeah, I worked on traumatic brain injury and and uh, hemorrhagic shock, which is uh, bleeding models. So, yeah, yeah I, those, those mice had bad days when they were in my room. I can imagine that sounds like a, a bad way, a bad day for anyone, not just mice. Yes, I did listen to a lot of podcasts though, <laughs> and ebooks. Uh, I imagine you'd need something to distract you. <laughs> so. Wow, that's <laughs> woo woo. All right, so uh, your book is about Thomas, and he's a regular Joe who gets transformed into a puma slash mountain lion slash cougar. Well, no, are they is cougar another proper term for them? Excuse me, my cat is making noise. Yo. <laughs> Speaking of cougars, <laughs> flee, furball, flee. Not close all the way, and he will pop his little head in on him. Yeah. Yo, no. <laughs> it's okay, man. This is great for the views. YouTube loves cats. <laughs> uh, I put a box in front of the door. It doesn't lock, but the box will work. Will work. Unless he gets really determined. <laughs> so, Thomas gets turned into a cat. He gets conscripted, or attempts to, people attempt to conscript him, and he's having none of it. Uh, into being a familiar and this chain of events gets set off where he uh, ends up kind of freeing an interdimensional eldritch horror and all kinds of shenanigans in, ensues in the in, in the in between so with that being the plot uh, there's some stuff that goes by the wayside and that's what my first question is about um, you talk about how there's this veil and there's no, there isn't really much communication between people on the magical side of the veil and the regular Joe side of the veil. So my question is, uh, what what does happen with Thomas's family? Does he just let it go with those goodbye emails he sent and call it good, or is there more stuff about them down the line? He pretty much calls it good. Um, there's, um, there, there's he he really gets too busy. <laughs> 
That's a sign of a good story. In the, in the later books. Um, the veil works basically two ways, because not only does um, it make it difficult for his family to remember him, it makes it him it difficult for him to remember his family. So there's a couple mentions in, in there, but the rest of the series really focuses on his relationships in the magical wor- world. World, yeah. So. That makes sense. That does make sense. You don't want to you don't want to bog down the fantastical happenings with family politics. So I get that. There's plenty of politics. Oh but yeah, just not family ones. Wizard politics. There's plenty of that in the first one that I read. And yeah. Oh God. Yeah. The, the later books. Uh, there gets to be more. He he gets a little power in the in the later books, and you know a giant robot rudy gets his giant robot eventually as shown in <laughs> cover four <laughs> very nice Hobba, pyrotechnic squirrels with robots is just that's what everyone needs in their book damn it. he gets a little one in book two and he's really happy with that <laughs> uh that's fucking hilarious so that actually that's a decent segue into my next question rudy being a good example um unless you're gonna enlighten me on something but uh um, you make it clear that there's uh, familiar animals who used to be humans. That's what Thomas is. He got mm-hmm. transmuted. But there's it's also pretty clear that some of the familiars have been animals their whole lives. And yeah. so where do the non-ex-human familiars get their human-like intelligence? So it goes into the whole anchor concept. You know how... Um... Thomas has a bone whistler on the other side of his his anchor, mm-hmm. right? Um, well, what happens in in the case of when the animals awaken, if they get themselves tied to somebody else who's sentient, then they kind of get that mind. Okay, so that kind of makes so when a familiar is awakened which is which is their magical potential is realized they get anchored to a person and they kind of hop on that person's cognition right right they kind of share that's how you know in the case of the transformations they get a human just basically connects with this other being and they have the misfortune where the awakening basically overlaps realities and they basically switch bodies before for realities like oh that's not that's this is messy i gotta untangle all this <laughs> yeah I, I remember that small section in the book where thomas saw the cougar running around in his body in another dimension and i was like that's gotta be surreal as hell <laughs> <laughs> so okay that's a that's a pretty because yeah man the, yeah those animals especially rudy Fucking pyrotechnic little bit. <laughs> but I, that leads me so. Rudy, Rudy was a lark. He wasn't in my original character sketches at all. He just kind of popped up. He just popped up. I needed like somebody in, in Thomas's house, like initially, and yeah, he wasn't in the character list, and it just like, oh. <laughs> so did and he just stalk around? <laughs> He's like grabbing grabbing the camera. <laughs> he does a good job of that. He, he oh yeah. He steals attention whenever he's on page. I think he's probably my favorite character. Uh, but that does raise an, a follow up question: Was he? Did he get awakened with a human, or did he used to be human? Rudy is very complicated. He has the backstory story, which would be spoilers. <laughs> Got it. All right. <laughs> I, I will say, Rudy's been around for a long time. <laughs> All right. Go read the next ones, I guess, guys. Because, <laughs> yeah, Rudy, yeah, it's like he's not attached to anyone, and but he's got so much personality, and he he really steals the show whenever he's on page. Like I said, I, like I, said I think he's my favorite guy. Yeah, there's a little less Rudy in the later books simply because there's so many other character characters, but he... he he turn turns the events quite often when when he does when he is around and he is always around round he the core the core um trio thomas omera and rudy stick are are constant throughout all three book 
books, all, all four books. Omera kind of takes a vacation in book two, but um, she, mm. she's, I haven't, she sticks around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got you. I got you. So my next question is about your magic system. Um, uh-huh. I wanted to ask, because magic systems, they run the gamut, and I, I couldn't, I don't know enough about real world mythology to say for sure, so I had to ask, is yours based off existing real world mythology, any lore, or was yours really uh, mostly a creation of your own mind? I mean, it's a framework which you can fit a lot of mythology in, but it's really, um, it's really just uh, an alternative dimension hypothesis. I get into it a little bit more in in the later books, but um, the idea is that there are infinity other infinite other realities, and we are in a three dimensional plane. But the these realities sort of stack in a fourth dimensional way, way kind of on top of each other, mm-hmm. and so magi are basically. Three three dimensional beings plus they can kind of like reach out and grab stuff from other universes and pull it in, and the things that they really fear is our true fourth dimensional beings, which would be the dragon at the end of the book, right? right. And you know the veil itself is sort of like this fourth dimensional nanny that's kind of making sure the humans don't get out of their current reality. That's kind of an interesting concept. <laughs> That's kind of a fun little thought experiment to play around with, even outside of fiction. What if what if humans are limited in our ability to perceive the universe and extra-dimensional entities and other stuff like that because there's an interdimensional nanny state? <laughs> right. Well, the, the backstory is uh, the Atlanteans actually got out and caused some sort of trouble, which basically stripped um and got the attention of this overlord or veil and it purposely blinds humans to magic and that's why in the loophole is they can use familiars to to see magic right and that that little bit is reaching into real world mythor uh, mythor (laughs) mythology and uh and kind of grabs out a few different cultures um, ideas of magic because the idea of animal familiars working with shaman and magic users of all kinds of cultures that's that's been in right, everywhere right. around the globe throughout time so that one is that one is ambiguous right yeah, well that's very core to you know freelance familiar familiars as a concept i just kind of one upped it where like familiars are required for magic versus they're kind of nice to have around, yeah. but if they're required, they become commodities because humans make everything commodities, and um, and they're how therefore we get the sort of like very feudal cu- culture which Thomas is is thrust into, and, and thoroughly you know, rejects. <laughs> right, <laughs> the most admirable quality about him, he he gets thrust into this absolutely shit sandwich situation. He says. I'm not having none of this. <laughs> it's the most admirable thing about the whole character, in my opinion. Thomas is incredibly stubborn, and that is his kind of his superpower. Power. And he's just big enough, and he's just powerful enough to make it work. That sounds a lot like a, a certain detective wizard I'm very fond of. <laughs> right. Right. Um... <laughs> Yeah, so, um, a I'm, lot of. I'm not a big fan of like super overpowered pro tags that just sort of Same. blow things down. It's Same. always, and Thomas does get quite a bit more powerful as he learns what he is, and he gets some circumstances. I haven't been able to completely avoid the temptation of, of you know, giving him some neat neat abilities. Oh yeah, but. Um, He's 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 not a wizard. He can't do magic without of uh, a bond. Mm-hmm. And fortunately for him, Omer is really powerful compared to a lot of Magi. She just doesn't doesn't have a good rep. <laughs> <laughs> 
Again, certain detective wizard. Yeah, yeah, you know that that stubborn protagonist thing. It's a lot of protagonists fall into that to one degree or another just because stubbornness is actually a virtue when you look at its application in real life. As long as it's tempered by a little bit of intelligence and common sense, stubbornness right. is almost always an asset. And right. so that's why so many good protagonists, Harry Dresden, um, Raphael from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, so many video game protagonists, I can't even begin to list them all. Uh, you know, every good book protagonist, they're a little bit too stubborn for their own good sometimes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it makes a character so much more believable, too, because everyone knows either you are or you know someone who's just so fucking stubborn it makes the character relatable because like yep yep i fucking know that person in my life or i am that person right right <laughs> and and the powerful thing just the uh, same thing with that too is um yeah that's unavoidable power creep is unavoidable if you if you want the story to progress people got to start scaling so yeah i mean it's it's one of the things in modern life is like oftentimes you, you know, you can say no as much as you want and life will just bowl over you, over yes. you. Right. And you don't really get a say. And if you do that, I mean, you, you have to have a protagonist that has the ability to affect the story story, right. unless you're, you're doing sort of this, death march kind of thing right thing um and so you need to balance their abilities with what they're facing and make it so they can affect what's happening to the to them and um giving them you know superpowers or or powers you know most of the the freelance familiar with books, they still come down to a fight at the end. And, you know, that's where it comes down to, to in their, their world there. Um, at the end of the day, you've kind of got to throw down if you're really going to have a shot shot, but, you know, Thomas is just about much as about his allies as he is being a badass. Well, I based on the first book at least, I wouldn't even say Thomas's stick is being a badass. I think no, he's he's, not. he's very much <laughs> just a hey man, I just want to live my life kind of guy. Right. And right. The, and, right. and he I mean he almost takes the I'm an average Joe protagonist thing to the insufferable level. I mean, yeah. he's riding that line. He's very much like, look, man, I don't want to be here. I'm not even supposed to be here today. <laughs> so He does get, definitely get over that as the series progresses. Yeah, oh, that's, that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> of, um, that is very much part of his growth. Um, you know, by the end of the third book, he has responsibilities. He is slowly trying to solve problems as he see sees them and he is very much well really by the third book in the third book they leave grantsville behind and he and two, he and, Ru and rudy are trying to open the actual freelance familiars like uh office in the third book they're they decamp for vegas for reasons that are very clear in the after the second book <laughs> gotcha <laughs> Gotcha. Uh, so, um, stepping back some, to something you previously said, uh, I actually have this the exact thing you said in my notes. Cindy is very powerful. <laughs> and she's... Omera? Or, no, Cindy. Oh, wait, you oh. did say you did say Omira. My apologies. Right, right, Wrong right. character. Oh, Cindy. <laughs> Cindy, yeah, the cat. Excuse me. My bad. That's a that's a that's a slip of the brain on my one. Right, right. So Cindy, the cat, was very powerful, and mm -hmm. she clearly had um, aspirations. She was she had motives, goals of her own. So I'm I'm wondering, 
that obviously scales to other animals too. Cause she, she, if there's one, there's more. So my, my thought process on that is why isn't the Tao taken more seriously and why haven't they rebelled against the Magi in some kind of a more meaningful way? Cause it really feels like despite the fact that they've unionized, they still kind of get kicked around. Um, that's sort of like the primary, uh, in t- or, um, the primary antagonist that develops once um, at on the third third book on is Oric. So there's a lot more complexity to the Tau than is gone into in book one. Gotcha. I thought that might be the case because you did send me um, the first three books. And I just, I simply do not read as fast as even the average reader. <laughs> well, if you're trying to do one of these a week, I can understand. <laughs> well, and it, it's not even, I mean, there are some people like my, my dad is a voracious reader uh-huh. and he can go through three of these books in a week. I simply can't read that fast. I clocked my reading speed. I'm below the national average. My comprehension, mm-hmm. college level. I comprehend reading excellently. My speed, mm-hmm. garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I read slow. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, that that one. So yeah, that makes sense that it gets a, a light and in, it, it gone into more because that, I certainly think there's a lot of potential for uh, so, shenanigans to say the least. <laughs> I'm very good at at le- at dropping hints and then like, oh yeah, I should go back to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I like to do that. Foreshadowing is like my favorite thing to do. I love foreshadowing. I foreshadow with every little possible oh, way sure. I can. There, there's foreshadowing, and then there's like, if it's not, if it doesn't come true, it was just a red herring, right? Oh uh, yeah, that too. It's like, look, man, you thought <laughs> it was gonna be I'm something. Actually, do that right You now. were just wrong because I misdirected. <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was a bait and switch. <laughs> right. Uh so, um, another, another big one. So throughout the first book, Thomas is one of his major motivations is trying to be human again. And that only starts to bleed away towards the very end of the book. But it's still, I still couldn't help but wonder at the end where he's dealing with the dragon, which is an, it certainly feels like a, an omnipresent, all powerful entity, at least by human standards. Why didn't he ask the dragon to make him human again? It didn't even cross his mind. Oh, God. I thought it might be something. I was like, <laughs> did he really just forget to ask? <laughs> That's, that is frustrating, yet entirely believable. <laughs> he was so focused on, you know, trying to fix the situation. He didn't think about himself. And, you know... Yep. Thomas ultimately doesn't really think about himself when he's in danger. And that's part of the reason where, you know, he becomes a hero that he is. And um, there's a real kindness to Tom. Oh yeah. I would agree with that. He's, he's certainly firmly in the neutral good area of the alignment chart right from the get go. He, I would never portray him or think of him as morally gray or morally ambivalent. He's firmly in the good guy category. He makes compromises on that, that because yeah. he has to sometimes. Right. And he feels really guilty after. <laughs> yes. <but. laughs> well, see, that get, a feeling of guilt is one of the ways you know someone <laughs> is morally on the good side right. of the spectrum. Right. Because guilt is one of the main things that defines morality. If you can do anything without feeling guilt, it's because you're evil or, <laughs> or a sociopath or both. Right, right. So, my next my next question is about the exact well, the exact same time frame in the book, the dragon. What? <laughs> most people think of a dragon and they think of a scaly lizard either with wings or without um fire breathing a lot of the time potentially some other elemental elemental association 
and that's the classical depiction of a dragon. Yours is a fourth dimensional giant worm with hundreds of thousands of eyes and a mouth a mile long. <laughs> Let me hear the thought process behind making your dragon an eldritch horror. <laughs> well, the 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 whole thing was like what would be scary to, you know, instead of like what we classically think a dragon is, What's scary to a magus? <laughs> that was what it it was, you know. Um, and you know they have reptile-y features, and I I just I thought that's that's what the the magi would refer to as a dra dragon, a classic dragon. They're like, oh, it's a big elemental. Let's go kill it and harvest all its tat. Yeah, tass, tass. And grind it up for parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that really struck me as being odd. I, I was like reading the description of this thing, and I was like, that's certainly not a classical dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I wanted, I wanted something where, like, you say a dragon, and the mag guy go, "Oh shit!" Yeah. <laughs> no, it is, it is that. Like I, like I said, it is obviously tremendously powerful with some of the things we see it do, and right. just looking upon it would drive many people to raving, at least <laughs> temporary madness. I mean, it is an abomination unto God's earth. <laughs> Yes, it was real, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. I, yeah. I really liked liked having this huge interdimensional horror as basically the damsel. <laughs> that was uh, that was a funny little uh, not quite in the juxtaposition uh, sub subversion of tropes, subversion yeah. of cliches. Because yeah, you you made the damsel in distress this eldritch horror which is just a, a hilarious concept in and of itself meanwhile there's an actual like there's an actual female interest in the story that could have been the damsel in distress and she's a fucking werewolf <laughs> who who was in in distress at no point in the book <laughs> well i mean maybe you could argue she was in distress because she was being mind controlled by cindy I, that's that one is one of those things. It's like, well, but she wasn't in danger. But Spoiler: she Their controlled. relationship doesn't work out. Ah, <laughs> that, that leaves a bad taste in my mouth. <laughs> I was rooting for him. Well, um, Thomas gets new girl girlfriends later on. Uh, Pride Fall is a lot about um, Sheena, who is a uh, five hundred pound lioness. 500 pound line you just had thomas has a thing for girls that are bigger than him i guess doesn't he <laughs> just much more just much more bulky than his person <laughs> you know she pulls him into a civil war it's 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 not a relationship without baggage <laughs> ah the old if you want some of this you gotta come fight for me classic <laughs> Well, she was trying to become a god, but, you know, that, that, ah, that gets complicated. The old, I couldn't become a god, so now I'm going to have a rebound relationship. <laughs> Classic. I'm, I'm being a smartass, if you can't tell. I mean, it's a real good series to be a smartass about. about. It's fun. It is fun. It's, um, it I, I like to think tone. it's very unique. Um it really tends to to pull people in, in once they give it a shot shot and um no it's a lot of fun i will um i will write more i'm working on uh, something new right now now and um but i will probably return try and get a a six book out next year is it are you going to try to wrap the series up with that sixth book or do you think you're going to keep it going for much longer um, I'm hoping to wrap up at least uh, ra wrap it up in another one or two. I might keep in then depending on I might do a, a second like freelance familiar 
series, but from somebody else's point of view. And Thomas, if he's if he's still around, will be kind of like the guy up there, <laughs> the <Yeah>. boss. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, have him be the CEO. If he doesn't sacrifice himself in, and... in a blaze of glory, which he has tried to do several times. <laughs> God, now that is a that is classic hero. <laughs> Omera's like grabs his tail. Nope. <laughs> I'm not dying. <laughs> Look, man. I know you want to be the hero, but I sh- I'm promising you. Dying right now isn't gonna help it. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, man. So uh, the book is Freelance Familiars. First book uh, is Off Leash. You are Daniel Potter. Where can people go to find you? Where can people go to find your work? Um, you can find uh, my author's website at DanielPotterAuthor.com. Um, and I am on Twitter at Fallen Kitten Pro. That's from uh, Fallen Kitten Productions, which was my original webcomic company. Um, and it just stuck. I like it. And again, I'm on Facebook under Daniel Potter or Fallen Kitten Productions. Uh, both both will Google or search. And that's that's about it. I mean, I have an Instagram, but I don't check it. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah and i um if you look in my fifth book there's a there's a link to my discord discord at the end of there there and we've got a a nice little community that's growing slow slowly and i love to chat and hang out with folks and say oh i'm doing this and you know what do you think of this cover what about this artist and you know if you you want a little insight into what's going on that's a good place to hang out (laughs) gotcha gotcha there you have it folks uh i appreciate you making the time i appreciate you working with me after that uh boo-boo on my end yesterday power outages are especially in winter it's like they always happen in winter always (laughs) so no worries i appreciate your time um everything that he just said will be down in the description book review will be live promptly i appreciate your time again sir you have a good rest of your day thank you all righty man be well